Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 5. Since the bill was always on time, and nearly everyone else in the world, as far as she was concerned, never was, she was surprised to find Philip already sitting at the table he reserved for dinner. He rose, offered her a killer smile, and a single yellow rose. Both charmed her and made her suspicious. Thank you. My pleasure. Sincerely, you look wonderful. She'd gone to some trouble in that area, but more for herself than for him. The call from her mother had left her miserably depressed and guilty. She tried to fight off both emotions by taking a great deal of time and putting a great deal of effort into her appearance. The simple black dress with its square neck and long snug sleeves was one of her favorites. The single strand of pearls was a legacy from her paternal grandmother and much loved. She swept her hair up and a smooth twist and added sapphire and capuchin earrings that she had brought it bought in London years before. She knew it was the sort of fenament armor that women slipped into for confidence and power. She wanted both. Thank you again. She slid into the booth across from him and stiffed the rose. And so do you. I know the wine list here. You don't trust me? On why? Why not? Good. He glanced toward the server. We'll have a bottle of the number 103. She laid the rose beside the leather-bound menu. Which is? A very nice Paulo Fousse. I remember from Chinese that you like white. I think you'll find this is a very important step up from what you had there. Almost anything would be, he cocked his head, took her head. Something's wrong. No, deliberately she curved her lips what would be wrong it's just as advertised she turned her head to look out the window beside her where the bay stretched dark blue and exciting shopping under a sea going rose with sunset a lovely view a pretty spot she turned back an interesting companion for the evening no he thought watching her eyes something was just a little off on impulse he slid over kept her chin in his hand and laid his lips lightly on hers. She didn't draw away, but allowed herself to experience. The kiss was easy, was easy, smooth, skill, and very soothing. When he drew back, she raised an eyebrow. And that was because you look like you needed it. She didn't sigh, but she wanted to. Instead, she put her hands in her lap. Thank you once again. Any time, in fact. His fingers tightened just a little on her face, and this time the kiss moved a bit deeper, lasted a bit longer. Her lips parted under his before she realized that she meant it to happen. Her breath caught, released, and her pulse shivered as his teeth scraped lightly as his tongue teased hers into a slow, seductive dance. Her fingers were lengths and gripped tight, her mind just beginning to blur when he eased away. And that was because she managed. I guess I needed it. His lips brushed over hers once, then again, before she found the presence of mind a hand on his chest, a hand she realized that wanted to ball into a fist on that soft shirt and hold him in place rather than nudge him away. But she nudged him away. It was simply a matter of handling him, she reminded herself, or staying in control. I think his appetizers go. That was very appealing, but we should order her. Tell me what's wrong. He wanted to know, he realized. Wanted to help. Wanted to smooth those shadows out of her incredibly clear eyes and make them smile. He hadn't expected to develop a taste for her so quickly. It's nothing. Of course it is. And there can't be anything much more therapeutic than dumping on a relative stranger. You're right, she opened a minute, but most relative strangers aren't particularly interested in someone else's minor problems. I'm interested in you. She smiled as she shifted her gaze from the entree to his face. You're attracted to me. That's not always the same thing. I think I'm both. He took her hand, held it as the white wine was brought to the table. As the label was turned from his approval, he waited while a sample was poured into his glass. Watching her in the study, all ease, all else the sideways, she discovered he had. He lifted it, still looking at her. It's perfect. you like it. He murmured to her while their glasses were being filled. You're right. She told him after she... I like you very much. Shall I tell you? Shall I tell you tonight's specials? The waiter began in a careful voice. While he recited, they sat, hands linked, eyes locked. So Phil decided she heard about every third word and didn't really give a damn. He had the most incredible eyes, like old, like old gold, like something she'd seen in a painting room. I'll have the mixed salad with the vinegar and the fish of the day grilled. <laughs> he kept watching her, his lips curving slowly as he drew her hand across the table to kiss her palm. <laughs> The same. And take your time. I'm very attracted. He said to Sibyl, what's the way to roll his eyes? And I'm very interested. Talk to me.
All right. What harm could it do? She decided since sooner or later they would have to deal with each other on a different sort of level. It might be helpful if they understood one another now. I'm the good daughter. Amused at herself, she smiled a little. Obedient, respectful, polite, academically skilled, professionally successful. <laughs> it's a burden. Yes, it can be, of course. I know better intellectually than to allow myself to be ruled by parent express expectations at this stage of my life. But, Philip said, giving her fingers, you yeah, are. We all are. Are you? He thought of sitting by the water in the moonlight and having a conversation with his dead father. More than I might have believed. In my case, my parents didn't give me life. They gave me the life. This life. And yours, he considered, since you're the good daughter, is there a bad daughter? My sister has always been difficult. Certainly she's been a disappointment to my parents, and the more disappointed they become in her, the more they expect from me. <laughs> You're supposed to be perfect. Exactly, and I can't be. She wanted to be, tried to be, couldn't be, which, of course, equally failed. It could, how could it be otherwise, she mused. Perfect is boring, Philip commented, and intimidating. Why well, try to be either? So what happened? Yes, when she only frowned. It's nothing, really. My mother is angry with me just now. If I give in and do what she wants. Well, I can't. I just can't. <laughs> so you feel guilty and sad and sorry. And afraid that nothing will ever be the same between us again. As bad as that? <laughs> it could be. Someone murmured. I'm grateful for all the opportunities they gave me. The structure of the education. We traveled quite a bit. So I saw a great deal of the world of different cultures while I was still a child. It's been invaluable in my work. Opportunities filled up structure, educational travel, nor had she listed love, affection, fun. He wondered if she realized she described a school more than a family. Where did you grow up? Um, here and there. New York, Boston, Chicago, Paris, Milan, London. My father lectured and held consultations. He's a psychiatrist. They live in Paris now. It always and was always my mother's favorite city. Long distance guilt. <laughs> it made her laugh. Yes, she sat back as they sounds were served. Oddly enough, she did feel a little better. It seemed slightly less deceptive to have told him something about her, so. And you grew up here? I came here when I was 13, when the Quins became my parents. Became? <laughs> it's part of that long story. He lifted his wine glass, studying her over his rim. Normally, he'd be brought up. If he brought up that period of his life with a woman, what he told was a careful edited version. Not a lie, but a less than detailed account of his life before the quince. Oddly enough, he was tempted to tell us to build a hole, the ugly, and the unvarnished truth. He hesitated and settled on something between the two. I grew up in Baltimore, on the rough side. I got into trouble, pretty serious trouble. By the time I was 13, I was headed for worse. The quince gave me a chance to change that. They took me in, brought me to St. Chris, became a family. They adopted you? She had that much information from researching everything she found out, about, could find out about Raymond Quinn, but didn't give her the why. Yeah. They already had Cam and Ethan in the maid room for one more. I didn't make it easy for them initially, but they stuck with me. I never knew either of them to back off from a problem. <laughs> Thought of his father, broken and down in a hospital bed, even then Ray's concern had been for sons. Said her family. When I first saw you, Sibyl began, the three of you, I knew you were brothers. No real physical resemblance, but something less tangible. I'd say you're an example of how environment can offset heredity. More an example of what two generous and determined people can do for three lost boys. She sipped her wine to see the threat before she and said, Lost boy number four. We're trying to do for him what my parents would have done, what her father asked us to do. My mother died several years ago. She left the four of us floundering some. She was an incredible woman. We couldn't have appreciated her enough when we had her. I think you did. Moved by the sound of his voice, she smiled at him. I'm sure she felt loved. <laughs> I hope so. After we lost her, Cam took off for e Europe. Racing, boats, cars, whatever. He did pretty well at it. Ethan stayed, bought his own house, but, but it's locked into the bay. But he's locked into the bay. I moved back to Baltimore. Once an urbanite, he added with a quick smile. The inner, har the inner harbor, Camden Yards. Exactly. Came down here often on holidays, the occasional weekend. But it's not the same. Curious, she told her that. What do you want it to be? She remembered her secret throw when she got off to college to be on her own, not to have every moment and word weighed in, judged. Freedom! <laughs> no, but there were times, 
Our times. I miss the way it was. Don't you ever think back to some perfect summer? You're 16, your driver's license is shiny, and you knew in your wallet, and the world is all yours? <laughs> she laughed, but shook her head. She hadn't had a driver's license at 16. They'd been living in London that year, as she recalled. There had been a uniformed driver to take her where she'd been allowed to go, unless she managed to slip out and ride the tube. That had been her small rebellion. Sixteen-year-old boys, she said, while their salad plates were moved, their entree served, are more emotionally attached to their cars than sixteen-year-old girls are. It's easy for that boy to get himself a girl if he has wheels. <laughs> I doubt you had any trouble in that area, with or without a car. And stuff the neck in the back seat until you've got one. True enough, and now you're back here? And so are your brothers? Yeah. My father had says through complicated and not entirely clear circumstances. Says mother, well, you'll hear talk if you stay in the area for any length of time. Oh, it's a pill gun or fish, hoping that she can swallow it. My father taught English lit at the university, the Eastern Shore campus of Maryland. A little less than a year ago, a woman came to see him. It was a private meeting, so we don't have the details, but from all accounts, it wasn't pleasant. She went to the dean and accused my father of sexual harassment. So Bill's fork clattered on her plate. It's casual it's good. She looked at it again. That must have been very difficult for him. For all of you. Difficult isn't quite the word for it. She claimed to have been a student here just years back and said that at that time he had demanded sex for grades, intimidated her, had an affair with her. No, she could no, she couldn't swallow some pill real eyes, gripping her fork until her fingers. She had an affair with your father? No. She said she did. My mother would still have been alive. He said after himself. In any case, there's no record of her ever attending the university. My father taught on that campus for more than 25 years without a whisper of improper behavior. She took a shot at destroying his reputation, and it left to smear. Of course, there be no true to it, Sibyl thought wearily. It was Gloria's usual pattern. Accused, damaged, ruined. But she herself still had a part to play. Why? Why would she do that? Money. I don't understand. My father gave her money. A great deal of it for Seth, she says, mother. You're saying that she, she traded her son for money. Not even Gloria could do something so appalling, she told herself. Surely not even Gloria. That's difficult to believe. Not all mothers are maternal, he jerked her. He had a check for seven, several thousand made out to Gloria DeLotner. That's her name. And he went away for a few days, then came back with Seth. Say nothing. She picked up her water glass. Cool with her. He came and got Seth, Gloria had sobbed to her. They got Seth. You have to help me. A few months later, Philip continued, he drew almost all his savings out into a cashier's check. He was on his way back from Baltimore when he had an accident. He didn't make it. I'm so sorry, she murmured the words regardless, recognizing their inadequacy. inadequacy. He hung on until Cam got him from Europe. He asked the three of us to keep that, to look out for him. We're doing everything we can to keep that promise. I can't say it wasn't rough for a while. He had it smiling a little now, but it's never been dull. Moving back here, staying, starting a boat business, not such a bad deal. Cam got a wife out of it. He had it with Grant Anna, his Seth's caseworker. Really? They couldn't have known each other very long. I guess when it hits, it hits. Time doesn't factor in. <laughs> She always believed it, it vitally to be a successful marriage took planning and dedication and a strong, solid knowledge of one's partner as assurance of capability, as assessment of personal goals. Then again, the portion of the Quinn's again, then again, that portion of the Quinn dynamics wasn't her concern. That's quite a story. How much was true, she wondered, sick at heart. How much was slanted? Was she supposed to believe that her sister had sold her own son? Somewhere in the middle, she decided the real truth could be generally be found, somewhere between two opposing stories. Philip didn't know she was sure of that. He had no clue what Gloria had been to Raymond Quinn. When that single fact was added to the mix, how did it change everything else? At this point, it's working out. The kid's happy. Another couple of months and the permanent guardianship should be wrapped up. And this big brother stuff has its advantages. Gives me somebody to boss around. She needed to think. She had to put emotion aside and think, but she had to get through the evening first. How does he feel about that? It's a perfect setup. He can bitch to Cam or reason about me, to me about Cam or reason. He knows how to play it. Seth's incredibly smart. They did placement tests when my father enrolled him in school. He's practically off the charts. His final report card for last year, straight A's. Really? She found herself smiling. You're proud of him? Sure, and me. I'm the one who got roped into being homework monitor. So recently, I've forgotten how much I hate fractions. 
Now that I've told you my long story, why don't you tell me what you think of St. Chris? I'm just getting my bearings. Does that mean you're staying a while yet? Yes, a while. You can't really judge a water town unless you spend some time on the water. Why don't you go sailing with me tomorrow? Don't you have to get back to Baltimore? Monday. She hesitated, then reminded herself that this was exactly why she was here. If she was to find the real, that real truth, she couldn't back away now. I'd like that. I can't guarantee what kind of sailor I'll be. We'll find out. I'll pick you up ten, ten thirty. That'll be fine. Oh, you say I'll match you right down to the docks. You'll have to take fresh on it. We won't bring them along. I'm not afraid of them. I'm just not used to them. You never had a puppy? No. Cat? No. Goldfish? She laughed cigarette. No. We moved around quite a bit. Once I had a schoolmate in Boston whose dog had puppies. They were just darling. Oh, she thought to remember that now. She wanted one of those puppies desperately. It had been impossible, of course. Antique furniture, important guests, social obligations. Out of the question, her mother had said. And that had been the end of it. Now I move around quite a bit. It's not practical. Where do you like best? He yes. asked. Yeah, I'm flexible. Wherever I end up tends to suit me. I'd sell him somewhere else. So right now it's St. Chris. Apparently, it's interesting. She gazed out the window. Where the rising moon glittered light onto the water. The pace is slow, but it's not stagnant. The mood varies as the weather varies. After only a few days, I'm able to separate the natives from the tourists and the watermen from everyone else. How? How? She distracted. She looked back and how can you tell one from the other? Just basic observation. I can look out my window on through the waterfront. The tourists are couples, more likely families, occasionally a single. They show where they shop. They rent a boat. They interact with each other, the ones in their group. They're out of their milieu. Most will have camera, map, maybe binoculars. Most of the natives have a purpose, being there, a job, an errand. They might stop and say hello to a neighbor. You can see them easing back on their way as they end the conversation. Why are you watching from the window? I don't understand the question. Why well, aren't you down on the waterfront? I have been, but usually I get a pure study when you, the observer, aren't part of the scene. I think you'd get more ver varied and more personal input if you were. You glance up as the waiter arrived, top off their wine and offer them dessert. Just coffee. So Bill decided, decaf. The same. Philip Linford, in your book, the section on isolations as a survival tactic, they explain you used of having someone lying on the sidewalk, how people would look away, walk around, some might hesitate before hurrying past. Not involvement, disassociation. Exactly. But one person would eventually stop, try to help. Once one person broke the isolation, others would begin to stop too. Once the isolation is breached, it becomes easier, even necessary, for others to join. It's the first step that's the most difficult. I conduct that study in New York, in London, and Budapest, all with similar results. It follows the urban social survival technique of avoiding eye contact on the street, of blocking the homeless out of our line of sight. What makes that first person who stops to help different from everyone else? Their survival instincts aren't as well honed as their compassion, or their impulse button is more easily pushed. Yeah, that, and they're involved. They're not just walking through, not just there. They're involved. And you think that because I'm an observer, I'm not. I don't know, but I think that observing from a distance isn't nearly as rewarding as experiencing it up close. Observing is what I do, and I find it rewarding. He slid closer, kept his eyes on her, ignoring the waiter who tightly served, tightly served the coffee. But you're a scientist. You experiment. Why don't you give experimenting a try? With me. She looked down, watched his fingertips away with hers, and felt the slow heat of response creep into her blood. That's a very novel, if not roundabout way of suggesting that I sleep with you. Actually, that wasn't what I meant. Though if the answer is yes, I'm all for it. He flashed her grin as she shifted her gaze wearily to his. I was going to suggest that we take a walk on the waterfront when we finish your coffee. But if you'd rather sleep with me, we can be in your hotel room in uh, five minutes flat. She didn't bathe when his head lowered to hers. When his lips slid lazily into a lovely fit over hers, the taste of him was cool, with an underlying promise of heat, if she wanted it. And she did. Surprised her how much, just at that one moment, she wanted to flash and burn. The man that would override the tension inside her, the worry, the doubts. But she had a lifetime of training against self-indulgence, and now she laid a hand lightly on his chest, then the kiss and the temptation.
I think a walk would be pleasant. Then we'll walk. <laughs> he wanted more. <laughs> Philip told himself he should have known that a few days ever would stir up the need, but he hadn't expected that need to be quite so sharp, quite so edgy. Maybe part of it was sheer ego. He mused as he took her hand to walk into her long, the quiet waterfront. Her response had been so cool and controlled. It made him wonder what it would be like to peel that intellect away, layer by layer, find a woman beneath, to work his way down to her pure emotion and instinct. He nearly laughed at himself. Ego, indeed. For all he knew, that formal, slightly distant response was precisely all that Dr. Sibyl Griffin intended to give him. If so, that made her a challenge he was going to have a very difficult time resisting. I see why Shiny's is a popular spot, she said in a smile look. It's barely 9.30 and the shops are closed. The boats are moored. Few people strolling along, but for the most part, everything here is tucked in for the night. It's a little livelier during the summer. Not much, but a little. It's cooling off. Are you warm enough? Hmm? Hmm? Plenty. It's a lovely breeze. Stop to look out the swaying mass of boats. Do you keep your boat here? No, we have a dock at home. That's Ethan Skipjack. Where? It's the only skipjack in St. Chris. There are only a couple dozen left on the bay. There, he gestured, the single mast. To run train eye, one sailboat looked very much like the same as the next. Size varied, of course, and gloss, but essentially they were all boats. What's a skipjack? <laughs> it involved from the flat bottom bay crabbing skiffs. He drew her close as he spoke. They were enlarged design with a V-shaped hull. It had to be easier and if expensively built. So they go out crabbing in them? No. Mostly the watermen use motor-powered boat workboats for cra crabbing. The skipjack is for oysters. Back in the early 1800s, they passed a law in Maryland that allowed only sail-powered vessels to dredge for oysters. Conservatives? Conservation? Exactly. The skipjack came out of that, and it still survives, but there aren't many of them. There aren't many oysters either. Does your brother still use it? Yeah, it's miserable, cold, hard, frustrating work. You sound like the boys of experience. <laughs> Put in some time on her. He stopped near the bow and slipped an arm around the Sailing out in February when that wind was cutting through you, bouncing on the high chop of a winter storm. All in all, I'd rather be in Baltimore. She chuckled, studying in the book. It looked ancient and rough, like something out of an earlier time. Without having set foot on it, I'm going to agree with you. So why were you bouncing on the high chop of winter storm instead of up in Baltimore? Beats the hell out of me. <laughs> I take it this isn't the boat you invited me out on tomorrow. No, that's one's a tidy little pleasure slope. Do you swim? She arched an Is that a statement on your sailing abilities? No, it's a suggestion. The water's cool, but not so cold. You can take a dip if you like. I didn't bring a bathing suit with me. And your point is? She laughed and started walking. I think it sails enough for me for one day. I've got work I want to finish up tonight. I enjoyed dinner. So did I. I'll walk you to your hotel. There's no need. It's just around the corner. Nonetheless. She didn't argue. She had no intention of allowing him to walk her to her door or talk his way into her suite. Oh, no. She felt she was handling him. In a difficult, confusing situation very well. An early night, she mused, would give her time to sort out her thoughts and feelings before she saw him again the next day. Since the boat was docked at his home, the odds were going good that she would see Seth again, too. I'll come down in the morning. I'll come down in the morning, she began as she stopped a few feet from the lobby. Ten or so. Fine. Is there anything I should bring besides Dremamine? He shot her again. I'll take care of it. Sleep well. You too. She prepared herself for the easy and expected goodnight kiss. His lips were soft, undemanding. Pleased with both of them, she relaxed, started to back away. Then his hand cupped the back of her neck firmly. His head changed angles, and for one staggering moment, the kiss went hot and wild and threatening. The hand she laid on his shoulder curled into a fist, gripping his jacket, hanging all for balance as his feet all but swept out from under her. As her feet all but swept out from under her, her mind went blank as her pulse slipped to roar in her spinning head. Some one moaned low and deep and long. Lasted only seconds, but it was as shocking and burning as a brand. It's all a stunned arousal in her eyes when they opened and stared into his, and he felt that basic knee claw to a new level inside her. Not a cool, controlled, and distant response. This time, he decided one layer down, he mused. It's going to stumble longer than jawline. I'll see you in the morning. Yes, 
Good night. He took over quickly and sent him a smile before turning. But she pressed an unsteady hand to her jittering stomach as she slipped into the lobby. She miscalculated that one, she admitted, finding to take slow, even breaths as she walked to the elevator. He wasn't as smooth. He wasn't as smooth, polished, and harmless as he appeared on the surface. There was something much more primitive and much more dangerous inside that attractive package that she realized. Then she realized, whatever it was, she found it entirely too compelling for her own good. End of chapter five.